Hi everyone! In this video we are going to look at heart anatomy, heart histology, and a little bit of heart physiology. So this is first of three videos on the heart chapter. So when we're looking at the cardiovascular system, the term cardio refers to off the heart and the term vascular pertains to off the blood vessels. So the cardiovascular system is essentially your heart and your blood vessels or your vasculature. And the major function of the system is to transport blood throughout the body. We know that blood is a liquid connective tissue and its most important function is to deliver oxygen gas and we looked at the physiology of exactly how oxygen gas goes from gas phase in the atmosphere to liquid phase uh, at your lung membranes uh, and transports to the heart and the heart then pumps it to the rest of your body. As your tissues are undergoing cellular respiration, they are generating carbon dioxide gas. So the job of the cardiovascular system is also to remove carbon dioxide gas from your tissues, bring it back to the heart from where it goes to the lung. And last unit, we looked at how carbon dioxide becomes a gas in your lung membrane or at your lung membrane and exits into the atmosphere. So the concept of perfusion is important when we are talking about heart physiology. So what perfusion basically means is how much blood in milliliters goes per minute. So we're talking about a frequency against time. So the milliliters of blood that goes per minute per gram of your tissues. So there are three variables going on here. The number of milliliters of blood that is going per minute per gram of your tissue. So uh, 1000 grams is a kilogram. So that determines so however many uh, grams or kilograms a person's weight is, it's that much blood in milliliters going per minute per gram of tissue. And in a healthy individual, uh, the perfusion rate has to be adequate. So basically the job of the perfusion rate is to ensure sufficient delivery of oxygen to maintain cellular respiration of body tissue and therefore cells. And normal perfusion rate requires normal function of the heart, so heart muscle working properly, the heart pumping the right amount of blood per minute, and the blood vessels being unobstructed, open, and healthy. So we normally know uh, blood vessels. Um, in your textbooks, there are blood vessels that are illustrated in red, and there are blood vessels that are illustrated in blue. So typically, the red ones are arteries. However, not all, as we talked about in your respiratory system chapter. So the definition of arteries, so arteries are blood vessels that carry blood away from the heart. So they are moving blood from the heart outwards. Those blood vessels are called arteries. And most of the arteries carry oxygenated blood. So blood that is saturated, the hemoglobin in this blood is saturated with oxygen. So this is oxygenated blood. The veins, which are typically illustrated in blue in your textbook, are the blood vessels that carry deoxygenated or carbon dioxide containing blood back to the heart. Now, most of them carry deoxygenated blood. The, the exception, the, the biggest exception that we talked about were the pulmonary artery and the pulmonary vein. Now, the pulmonary artery carries deoxygenated blood from the heart to the lung. So it's exiting, it's moving blood away from the heart, but it's carrying blood to the lung, which is where the carbon dioxide is going to be purged out. So the exception to the arteries carrying oxygenated blood is the pulmonary artery. 
And similarly, the exception to veins carrying deoxygenated blood is the vein. So typically, veins are blood vessels that carry blood back to the heart, right? So systemically, most of them are carrying deoxygenated blood back to the heart from where it's going to go to the lung. The exception, again, being the pulmonary vein. So the pulmonary vein is bringing blood inwards towards the heart, but because it's coming from the lung, it is carrying oxygenated blood. So the point to note here is that pulmonary artery carries deoxygenated blood and pulmonary vein carries oxygenated blood. Now, blood vessels split into several branches. The major blood vessels originate from the heart or organs and they are branched into several smaller and smaller branches until we get down to the minute branches called blood capillaries. So here we're looking at an illustration with blood vessels that are illustrated in red as well as the blue. So right here in your thoracic cavity, slightly I'm going to change the color of the marker to be green for more contrast. So the heart is positioned anterior on the anterior end of the body. It's anterior to your spine and it is slightly towards the left. Now the red blood vessels are typically arteries and they transport oxygenated blood from the heart outwards. So the red ones here are carrying blood from the heart outwards. The blue ones are the veins that are carrying deoxygenated blood from various areas of the tissues back into the heart. So the arrow for the blues is pointing inwards towards the heart because they're carrying blood inwards towards the heart. Now at the tissue level, here are the capillaries. So at the capillary level, here is where the red or the arterioles end. So this is where your oxygen is going to get unloaded, right? So oxygenated blood is coming from the heart. The oxygen is going to get unloaded into the tissues. At the same time here, carbon dioxide from the tissues is going to get loaded onto your blood vessels and is going to exit through the venules and it is headed towards the heart. Human beings have a four chambered heart. So I'm going to draw a stick figure of a heart here. Um, and it's, if you want to learn and you're a visual person, it helps to make a four chambered heart. So here I'm going to do four chambers, right? So this is one, two, and this is the right side of the heart. And these are chambers one, and two of the left side of the heart. Now it is important to note that this entire right side receives deoxygenated blood. So the right side is for deoxygenated blood. So from the right side, blood is headed to the lungs because deoxygenated blood carries carbon dioxide, Carbon dioxide has to be pumped to the lung, which is where it's going to go from liquid phase through the alveolar membrane into gas phase and out into the atmosphere. The next part, the left side of the heart contains oxygenated blood. So the left side receives oxygenated blood from the lung and from here, from the left side, this oxygenated blood is pumped to the rest of the body. So remember it this way. The right side is the deoxygenated side. The left side is the oxygenated side. The two superior chambers of the heart. So the two superior chambers of the heart are called atria. Atria. And the two inferior chambers of the heart are called ventricles. Now let's review that pulmonary and systemic circulation. So pulmonary circulation is when your 
all of the tissues in your body are undergoing cellular respiration. They are generating carbon dioxide. So carbon dioxide is loaded onto blood at that tissue level. So they pick up, so blood vessels are picking up deoxygenated blood from the right side of the heart and sending it from the heart to the lungs. Simultaneously at the lung, oxygen is picked up. So oxygen is loaded onto the blood at the lungs. And then the blood vessels are returning that blood to the left side of the heart from where it is going to go all over the body. Systemic, so pulmonary circuit is from the heart to the lungs, right? That's it. So pulmonary circuit is what's happening in the right atria and lung and left atrium to the lung. That is your pulmonary circuit. So systemic circulation is what is happening from the ventricles onwards. So oxygenated blood from the left side of the heart is sent to all the tissues in your body. So the basic pattern here goes from right side of the heart, everything is going to go to the lung. From the left side of the heart, everything is going to go to systemic tissues. Now, positioning wise, let us review what you already know, right? So right here, uh, you can kind of see the sternum, um, which is your chest plate. This is the manubrium of the sternum. Here is the body of the sternum, followed by a xiphoid process. You are also seeing all 12 pairs of ribs on each side. Now the heart is positioned posterior to the sternum and slightly on the left, which is why you will notice that on the left, on the left lung, there is this uh, marking that we went over, the cardiac notch right here. Uh, that accommodates the heart being slightly to the left. So the heart is traced right over here. So if you were to make, so this is rib number one, two, and three. So this illustration is showing a transverse cut right here at rib number three position. And here is your diaphragm. So that is the positioning of the heart between the two lungs, posterior to the sternum and superior to the diaphragm. So based on that transverse cut that we saw in the previous illustration at rib number three, what you're looking at right now is a bottom up view of the heart. So this is therefore the right lung and this is the left lung. So you're looking transverse from the patient's feet upwards, which is why this is the right side and that is the left side. This is your thoracic vertebra, which you should be able to easily recognize. And this is the sternum. So that makes this the anterior side, this the posterior side. So this is a frontal cut uh, anterior view of all the chambers of the heart. So let us start by identifying things that we already know. So the first thing that you know is that you already know that this is the diaphragm. So that would make this the inferior part of the heart and this is the superior side of the heart. Now we already know that the heart is four chambered and the two superior chambers are called atria. So this right here is the right atrium and this is the left atrium. We already know that the lower or the inferior chambers are called ventricles. So this is the right ventricle this is the left ventricle. So let's start by looking at the heart outside in. You already know that there is a serous membrane 
around the heart called the pericardium. Now the pericardium again has three layers. The outermost layer of the pericardium has tough collagen filled connective tissue. This is dense irregular connective tissue and it is called the fibrous because of all the collagen fibers it is called the fibrous pericardium. The next layer is called the parietal layer. So parietal pericardium. There is a space, a hollow if you will, followed by the visceral pericardium. So the visceral pericardium is the one that is continuous or the innermost layer of the pericardium um, and continuous with the epicardium. So we're going to talk about what epicardium is in just a minute. So the heart to review, the heart is surrounded by a layer of protective connective tissue. Uh, the outermost is the toughest, the fibrous pericardium, followed by the parietal pericardium, followed by the innermost, which is the visceral pericardium. There is a hollow space between the parietal and the visceral layers of the pericardium, and this space is filled with pericardial fluid. Now, this is the apex of the heart. So let me change color here. This right here, it's, it's kind of like a inverted conical shape. So this layer right here is the apex of the heart. You are seeing the two superior chambers and the two inferior chambers. Now the point to note is that right off the bat, you can see that the lower left chamber, so the left ventricle, has the thickest walls of all of the four chambers of the heart. So if you notice, this layer here, the walls of the lower left chamber, the lower or the left ventricle are the thickest. Now structure follows function. The reason why they are the thickest is that from the lower left chamber, aka the lower ventricle, blood has to be pumped the farthest, which is why there is more muscle around the left ventricle in order to have the most powerful contraction. Now, inflammation of those protective layers around the heart is called peri for periphery carditis. You already know itis is inflammation. And pericarditis can be caused by a lot of different um, microorganisms, um, including bacteria, fungi, or the acellular ones, which are the viruses. And what that can do is when there's abnormally high volumes of fluid in your pericardial cavity, it swells up and it restricts the heart's movement because there's just a finite amount of space in that pericardial um, layer uh, between the parietal and visceral layers and the more fluid there is the more that accumulates there and stays stagnant the more restricted the heart movement gets there's also something called friction rubs which is when there's pain um, in the chest um, accompanying a sort of crackling sound um, which can result in something known as a cardiac tamponade. So reviewing the external features of the heart, we are going to talk about it from the first start with the superior chambers and the inferior chambers. So here, let us talk about the apex. So this is the apex of the heart. Here is going to be your diaphragm. So this, on the superior two chambers of the heart, the two atria, the right atrium and the left atrium, both have a outpouching, which you can clearly see when we do lab, you will look at the heart models and notice these outpouchings that look like fatty tissue. And those are called auricles. So this right here is the right auricle. And beneath the right auricle lives the right atrium. This is the left auricle, 
and beneath the left auricle or, or behind posterior or beneath the deeper to the left auricle is the left atrium now i want to reiterate that the right side of the heart carries again deoxygenated blood so if i was to draw an imaginary line here this is your right side and this is the left side so the right side is where deoxygenated blood that's the deoxygenated blood section and the left side is the oxygenated blood section now this chamber right here behind this wall is your right ventricle and here is where your left ventricle is so here's the right ventricle left ventricle now you are also seeing a lot of red and blue tubes some larger ones some smaller ones going in and out of the heart so let's start on the right side first and then move on to the left side the two big blue tubes that you're seeing here this is the superior vena cava and this is the inferior vena cava so the job remember these are on the right side of the heart so the superior vena cava is basically bringing deoxygenated blood from the superior parts of your body so from your brain from your upper appendages your arms everywhere from your head your upper respiratory tract the superior vena cava brings deoxygenated blood from the superior region of your body and dumps it into the right atrium the inferior vena cava is bringing deoxygenated blood from the inferior parts of your body and also dumping it into that right atrium so a point to note here is all of the deoxygenated blood from everywhere in your body is coming and being dumped into the upper right chamber which is your right atrium now from there from the right atrium this blood is going to go into the right ventricle that's the one of the only places that blood can go from the right atrium is to the right ventricle now you're also seeing a large red tube over here now this is called your aortic arch this whole and the aortic arch is split into a few segments so the left side is basically all of your oxygenated side so let's start with what is happening how does blood come to your left atrium blood comes to your left atrium it's freshly oxygenated in your lungs and it gets dumped to that left atrium via this your pulmonary artery so this is from the left side this is from the right side it merges here and freshly oxygenated blood is dumped through your pulmonary artery even though it's blue and it gets in here and is purged right into the left atrium from the left atrium one of the only places it can go to is the left ventricle now from the left ventricle this freshly oxygenated blood and we talked about the left ventricle being the thickest in terms of its muscle wall from the left ventricle it is going through this ascending segment which is the initial the proximal segment through the aortic arch itself which is the curve and then to the descending aorta which is what you see here in the background it loops around posteriorly to the heart and goes down so the the direction of flow from the left ventricle is like this it's going outward it's going through here like that and there are branches of arteries that exit from your aorta and take oxygenated blood to the rest of your body now this is the posterior view of the heart now because this is the posterior view this is the right side of the heart and this is the left side of the heart you're looking back from behind 
towards the front. So reviewing that, this is the superior vena cava over here. This is the inferior vena cava. These two are going to open into the right atrium. Now, these two here are your pulmonary arteries. Remember, because they are carrying deoxygenated blood, even though they're arteries, they're exiting the heart, so they're arteries because they're taking blood away from the heart, and they're blue because they're carrying deoxygenated blood. And so these are coming from that right ventricle, going through your pulmonary trunk, and taking the direction of flow is out here, it is going from the right ventricle through the pulmonary arteries and back to the lungs, which is where carbon dioxide is going to exit back into the atmosphere. Now, what you couldn't see in that front view was how freshly oxygenated blood comes in to the heart. The freshly oxygenated blood is going to come in through your pulmonary veins. Now, these are carrying oxygenated blood and they're illustrated in red because they're incoming towards the heart. So the direction of blood flow through these four tubes is going to be inwards towards the heart. So these are your two left pulmonary veins. These are your two right pulmonary veins. And these are going to open up here in your left atrium. Now the freshly oxygenated blood goes into your left atrium. From the left atrium, it goes to your left ventricle. And from there, it is going to go through your ascending aorta, this aortic arch. And this is a section cut off of the descending aorta. Now, structure follows function. So when you look at the layers of the heart wall, the ventricles generally have the thicker walls than the atria because ventricles in general have to pump blood the farthest versus the atria. From the atria, blood is only going to go into the ventricles. Out of the two ventricles, the left ventricle has the thickest wall here, as you can see. Why does the right ventricle do not have walls that are this thick, right? So from the right ventricle, blood has to be pumped through your pulmonary artery just to the lungs. So it's not, it doesn't need as much po muscle power uh, because the blood has, does not have to be pumped the farthest versus from the left ventricle, blood has to go all through the body, which is why there's a need for more muscle power from the left ventricle. Now, if we look at the walls of the heart itself, and we're gonna do a sheep heart dissection where you can see these different layers to really appreciate what they look like. Now, as we did in the muscles unit, we do have various layers of the muscle wall itself. Followed, uh, which the first one is the outer layer called the epicardium. Now this is synonymous with the visceral pericardium. And it is made up of areolar connective tissue, which is the most common connective tissue. So this is the one that has all three protein fibers. It has your collagen, elastic fibers, and the reticular fibers. And its surface, the epicardium's surface, is lined by simple squamous epithelium because its function is to simply provide a smooth surface. It's not to absorb, it's not to protect, it is just to provide a simple smooth surface. The middle layer is where the actual muscle tissue is and this layer, the myocardium, myo is the root word for muscle. So the cardiac muscle, so throwback to the muscles chapter, we know that cardiac muscle tissue is unique. Um, and visually, when you see cardiac muscle tissue under the microscope, you can see the presence of those intercalated discs. So this middle layer, the myocardium, is made up of your cardiac muscle tissue. And the innermost is the endocardium. So endo is the root word for inside, cardium is for the heart, and this is a 
sort of a thin layer that covers the, the inside of the heart's hollow, right? We have those four chambers and wherever there's a surface, you have to have epithelial tissue. So this chamber, the endocardium, uh, covers the internal layer or the internal surface of the chambers. Now this is lined again with simple squamous epithelium and is rich in areolar connective tissue. So the lamina propria of the endocardium is a lot of areolar connective tissue. Now this is the uh, internal anatomy where we're going to go over, over structures that we have not yet gone over, right? So let's start with the right atrium. So this over here is the right atrium. You can see the hollow, the right auricle has been removed here. You're seeing a clear picture of the atrium itself. Now you know that this is the superior vena cava. This is the right pulmonary artery. You have your right set of pulmonary veins. Now you will notice if you palpate the heart models, you will notice that there is a ridgy surface on the atria. So you can see like the ridges on the surface right here. Now that is actually muscles called pectinate muscles. So the pectinate muscles are what you will palpate the ridges on the walls of your atria. Now over here you are seeing, so there's a septum that separates the two atria, right? So this is the left atrium here. So the septum between the two atria is called the inter for between atrial septum or separation. So this over here is your interatrial septum. And in that interatrial septum, you have a structure called the fossa ovalis. This right here is that fossa ovalis. Now, over here, you are noticing a hole, and that is where the lower vena cava, the inferior vena cava, is going to bring, and that hole right there you see is the opening for the inferior vena cava to bring the oxygenated blood into the right atrium. From the superior vena cava, it's going to come down again into that right atrium. Now from the right atrium, blood has to go to the right ventricle. So the septum that separates the atria from the ventricle has a valve. And these valves have a couple of different names. So here you see this this opening here is the valve itself. Now the, the word valve should tell you that this opening can be opened and closed as needed, right? So that's why it's a valve. It's not a free opening that's always open or always closed. So this is the right AV. The AV stands for atrioventricular valve. It is also called the tricuspid valve because it has three cusps or three curtains. So here are the three sort of like components of this valve. Number one, number two, and number three. So there's three flaps here, which is why it's called tricuspid valve, also known as the right atrioventricular valve. Now, this valve has to open and close, and so there are like collagenous structures here that will pull and push this valve open and shut. So these stringy structures that you're looking at, let me move, um, let me make the pointer green, and I'm drawing on these structures here in the green. So they're cord-like structures, like imagine like a curtain being pulled open and shut with like a cord. So these structures right there are tendinous cords, also known as chordae tendine. Now the job of the chordae tendine is to pull. So when they pull at the flap, the valve opens. When they push at the flap, the valve closes. 
However, you know that tendons do not contract and relax, right? You have to have muscle tissue that contracts and relaxes for things to move in the body. So these column or pillar-like muscles that I will shade in blue are called papillary muscles. So here's the column-like muscles. These that I'm shading on right now, those are your papillary muscles. So when the papillary muscles contract, there is pulling at the chordae tendine, and as a result, the flaps or the cusps of your tricuspid valve are opened. When the papillary muscles relax, the chordae tendine are relaxed, and they shut the cusps or the flaps of this tricuspid valve. Now, you will notice that the wall of the ventricle itself what color can I do here? I'll do it in purple. So the walls of the ventricle itself is sort of ridgy. And you can see kind of spiny structures here in the background. It's not a smooth surface. The, the, so there's ridges, kind of like rugae, really, for increased surface area, right? So here, they're not called rugae, but they're called trabeculae carnae. So trabeculae carnae are like the ridges or the pleats, if you will, on the ventricular walls. Next, let's talk about where the blood is going to go from, from this right ventricle, right? So this is the myocardium of the right ventricle. From here, when the ventricle squeezes, the blood is going to go out this way. So let me change the pointer to black and it goes out over here. So remember, again, this is the right side, so this is deoxygenated blood. Now, this right here is the valve again, right? Now, this valve is called the semilunar valve. Now, this is going to open the space, the, the flow of blood between that right ventricle into this tube, which is your pulmonary trunk, right? So this is all deoxygenated blood. It has to go back to the lung for the carbon dioxide to exit your system. So this blue tube right here is your pulmonary trunk. Therefore, this valve here is called the uh, pulmonary semilunar valve. It's, the spelling is right here. I realize this image is getting a little bit cluttered. So please bear with me. So this right here is the pulmonary semilunar valve. And from here, blood is going to go to your right and your left pulmonary artery and to your right and left lungs, respectively. Now, we can move on to the left side, right? So from the left side, first, let's talk about where blood comes from to that left atrium. So you have your left and right pulmonary veins. The blood is going to flow in this direction towards the heart through the pulmonary veins. Blood ends up in that left atrium. From the left atrium, it needs to go down here to the left ventricle. As with the right side, there's a similar valve on the left as well. The difference is that this atrioventricular valve, the left atrioventricular valve, only has two flaps or two cusps. So here's number one, here's number two. So this goes by a couple of names. You can call it the left atrioventricular valve. You can call it the bicuspid valve for two flaps, or you can also call it the mitral, M-I-T-R-A-L, mitral valve. So you also see the presence of the chordae tendine here. You also see the papillary muscles right here. So when the left ventricle squeezes, blood exits the ventricle through here. So this section right here, I'm going to make the pointer yellow and circle it quite a bit so you can see it. So this section right here, you can see the presence of a semilunar valve as well. So from the right ventricle, blood was headed to the lung, so you had the pulmonary 
semilunar valve. From the left ventricle, the semilunar valve opens into the aorta. So therefore, this is called the aortic semilunar valve. So the best way to study this is to draw your own heart diagram and start to label parts of the heart uh, on a diagram as many times as you can. So the location of the heart valves is important, right? So shaded in green on the top image are your atrioventricular valves. So to recap, this is your right atrioventricular valve. It has one, two, three cusps. Therefore, it is the tricuspid valve. And tricuspid valve separates the right atrium from the right ventricle. Here is your left atrioventricular valve. So the left atrioventricular valve has only two cusps, and it is also known as the bicuspid valve or mitral valve. Shaded in the yellow are your two semilunars. On the right side, you have your pulmonary semilunar valve, which separates the right ventricle from the pulmonary trunk and the pulmonary arteries. The left side is your aortic semilunar valve, which takes blood from your left ventricle through this valve and to your aortic arch. So therefore, what you're seeing, this is a transverse section. Your semilunar valves are located posteriorly and medially. So this is the posterior side. This is the anterior side. So in terms of anterior, posterior, medial, and lateral, your atrioventricular valves are anterior and lateral. Your semilunars are posterior and medial. So this set of diagrams, so when we're looking at any diagram, as I say, like you know the story of the diagram, you've understood the physiology or the anatomy that is trying to tell you. So let's look at the mechanism of action here. The top two images are the AV valves. The bottom two images are your semilunar valves. So blood flow, this is your right atrium here. So blood is going to fl flow from the atrium when the valve is open. So the valve opens when your papillary muscles contract. When the papillary muscles contract, the cords are pulled. When the cords are pulled, the flaps or the cusps, cusps end up opened and blood flows from the atria to the ventricle. So this diagram is showing you the cusps closed. In order for the cusps to close, the papillary muscles have to relax so that the cords are not pulled. So when the cords are not pulled, the flaps are in their shut position. The bottom two diagrams are showing you the opening and closing of the semilunars. So blood flows when the semilunars are open from one of the ventricles outward through the semilunars. So from the semilunars, blood is going from the heart outward. So blood flow is outward out of the ventricles from that semilunar valve. Now the next part that we're going to go over is put a star mark on this very, very important. We're going to talk about coronary vasculature. Now coronary vasculature is the vasculature of the heart muscle itself. So these are blood vessels that are taking oxygenated blood from the heart to the heart muscle so that the heart muscle can function. Those are your coronary arteries. You also have coronary veins that 
drain carbon dioxide from the heart muscle itself and bring it back to that right atrium of the heart. So this slide, we're first going to go over the coronary arteries. Now, most of these names might look overwhelming, but if you know your directional terms um, and root words, these are pretty easy to navigate. The first two are the two coronary arteries, right? So we'll talk about the major ones, and as we go inferiorly, we're going to look at the branches. So this right here is your right coronary artery, and this is your left coronary artery. And both of your coronary arteries are branching out of the ascending aorta. So this is the ascending aorta. This is your aortic semilunar valve. So blood, when the ventricle, when the left ventricle squeezes, blood moves this way. It goes through that aortic semilunar valve. And as soon as it ends up here, a little bit of that blood, freshly oxygenated blood, is going to go into your right and left coronary arteries. Let's start with the right one first. The right coronary artery is going to be wedged beneath the right auricle. So if you see this outpouching, you notice the right auricle, it's going to be wedged right underneath the bottom of that right auricle. And as it goes down, you're going to see some branches. So this branch is on the right side, and it's going all the way down the right anterior margin of the heart. This one, the one that I just shaded, is the right marginal artery. Right marginal artery. Now, the right coronary artery wraps around. So this is going to wrap around there, if you see the curvature that I just drew on and go on the posterior wall where you see it's shaded. And as it goes down, it's going to go back and go down all the way in the middle of the ventricles on the posterior side. That branch is called the posterior interventricular artery. So let's review. Right coronary artery goes down because on the right goes down it wedges underneath the right auricle and splits into the right marginal artery it wraps around that curvature of the heart and then has a branch called the posterior interventricular artery moving to the left side here's your left coronary artery it branches down in the front between the ventricles, right? So it's the front between ventricles. Therefore, it is the anterior interventricular. Inter is between, ventricular is the ventricle. So anterior interventricular artery. Now here it also wraps around from the left side and goes to the posterior surface of the heart. So that is your left circumflex artery. Talking about the coronary veins for this class, we are going to look at three coronary veins, starting with the great cardiac vein, right? So the great cardiac vein, um, you're seeing the anterior side here, the shading in blue is on the posterior side. So this, on the anterior side, the great cardiac vein sort of has branches on the ventricles. So this right here, the one that I'm shading on right now, is the great cardiac vein. The one on the back that goes along the interventricular region is the middle cardiac vein. And the one that is wedged beneath that right auricle is your small cardiac vein. And all of these three veins are going to open into a wider common area that's on the posterior side. 
and we will review this as we look at the models of the heart. So this region right here is called the coronary sinus. And the coronary sinus opens up into the right atrium because this is deoxygenated blood that we're talking about. So the last part of this video, this is the first of three videos of the heart, I'm going to talk about the histology of the heart muscle itself. So there's a little bit of throwback here to the muscle unit. So here you're looking at illustrations of the cardiac muscle cells, right? Now, cardiac muscle is striated and it is involuntary. So striations mean there is that striped appearance. When you look at the muscle under compound light microscope, it is going to appear to have stripes on it. It is involuntary, meaning that you cannot control it at will. And finally, it is the most fatigue resistant muscle out of all your three muscle categories. So the plasma membrane of cardiac muscle is called the sarcolemma. You already know this. This is the endomycium of the cardiac muscle. You're also looking at these green tubules, which are your T tubules. And a little bit of flashback here. So the T tubules are basically like if you're taking like meat and making holes with forks, right? So this is the, the T tubules are basically where sodium ions can go deep inside your muscle tissue to depolarize the muscle. That is what your T tubules are. They're taking depolarization or so in influx of sodium ions deep inside the muscle tissue. You're looking at the mitochondria here in large numbers um, and the nuclei. Now, the unique part about cardiac muscle tissue is the presence of the intercalated discs. So the intercalated discs are not present in skeletal muscle or smooth muscle. And when you zoom in on the intercalated discs, the intercalated discs are, they consist of desmosomes, which are the thumbtacks. This is a flashback to unit one, the tissues um, chapter of unit one of A&P. The desmosomes are the thumbtack welds, right? They allow, they're not as inflexible as your tight junctions. So desmosomes are like spot welds. So it's reinforcement structurally but not as inflexible of a reinforcement. And most importantly, it has gap junctions. Now gap junction is not exactly a structural junction. So it's not present for structural strength. The point of the gap junction is a functional junction. So this is like a canal that connects different cardiac muscle fibers. So gap junctions are functional junctions through which sodium ions can, it's, they're permeable to sodium ions. So sodium ions can go from one cardiac muscle fiber through the gap junction and depolarize the adjacent muscle fiber. So like we did in our skeletal muscle, you don't have to have a dance of the neurotransmitters between every single cardiac muscle fiber. So if you look at this micrograph, this is a compound light micrograph, and you're looking at these striations. So these stripes that you see oriented this way, those are the striations. You are looking at the ovoid nuclei pretty clearly here. You're looking at the striations. And these uh, structures that I'm going to circle in red, those are your intercalated discs right there. Now, we know that these are striated muscle, so you are going to have individual sarcomeres in the cardiac muscle as well. So if you remember from your muscle tissue chapter, your sarcomere appears striated because of certain bands, right? So you are going to have the Heller zone, the middle line, you are going to have the Z discs, 
the isometric bands and the anisometric bands in the cardiac muscles as well. We already talked about the point of the transverse tubules and the sarcolemma, which is the plasma membrane here. You also have the sarcoplasmic reticulum, which is the ER, like the smooth ER off the muscle tissue. And remember, the sarcoplasmic reticulum here is a reservoir of calcium ions. Now remember, cardiac muscle contraction cannot happen until the calcium ions go and bind to your contractile proteins. So sarcoplasmic reticulum is the reservoir for calcium, and that is where all the calcium is stored before it goes and binds to the troponin uh, for the tropomyosin to work. Now the last part here is the conduction system of the heart. Now, this will carry over to that next video. Um, I see this video is already getting a, long, a little bit longer at 55 minutes, but the, the electrical conduction system of the heart starts with, you don't have as, you don't have to have like the motor units for every um, bundle of cardiac muscle tissue like you do in the skeletal muscle. So the depolarization of the heart uh, happens through certain structures called pacemakers. And we have two pacemakers of the heart. The first one, I'll go into detail about this in the physiology video, which is the next one, but I just want you to know where the pacemakers are located. So the first of two pacemakers is called the sinoatrial node, the SA node, and it is located on the superior end of your right atrium. That is a sinoatrial node. The second node, the atrioventricular node, is located at the inferior end of the right atrium, right here. That is your AV node. Now from the AV node, there is a neural sort of bundle that exits and lives right here in this interventricular septum. That is called the AV bundle, the atrioventricular bundle. And as it enters the ventricular region, it splits into two. It branches, it bifurcates into two. So this is the right bundle branch. This is your left bundle branch. These bundle branches wrap around the apex of the heart and wrap around the ventricular walls. From there, they branch into smaller fibers called Purkinje fibers. We will talk about how the depolarization occurs in the following video. So I want to end right here and we'll start talking about the physiology of the heart in the second video.